Sitting on the beautiful Talico Lake is the replica of an 18th century British fort. The fort represents an attempt by the British to establish a presence in what was considered the Cherokee Overhill. During this time period, the British and French were competing for lands both on the European continent in what was known as the Seven Years' War and in the British colonies of the New World where the conflict was known as the French and Indian War. The area of the Cherokee Overhill was part of the British colony of South Carolina. This area was a great distance from other British forts and could only be reached by small single lane paths over the Appalachian Mountains. The British government needed the Cherokee as an ally in their fight against the French and would go to great lengths to secure this alliance. The Cherokee had agreed to fight on the side of the British. However, they were concerned that with their warriors gone, it would leave the women, children, and elderly vulnerable to attack by other enemy tribes or by the French. Trade was also a very important reason for both the Cherokee and British colony of South Carolina. The Cherokee wanted to trade European-made goods, and the British wanted to make sure they were the ones to supply those goods. The fort was built in the Overhill Cherokee Nation for a couple of reasons. To cement a military alliance between the colony of South Carolina and the Cherokee Nation. For economic reasons, so it would complete trade agreements between the colony of South Carolina and the Cherokee Nation. The Independent Company of South Carolina was sent in 1756 to construct and to garrison Fort Loudoun. The fort was named after John Campbell, the fourth Earl of Loudoun. Specifically, the location was chosen as a compromise between the fort's commander, Raymond Demaray, and the fort's engineer, William Gerard de Brown. The colonial soldiers built a large wooden palisade which enclosed an area that included barracks for both enlisted men and officers, a blacksmith shop, storehouses for both food and supplies, and a powder magazine. A large parade ground was in the center of the fort where soldiers could practice their drill and ceremony. The fort also included four bastions, each housing three cannons for protection of the fort's inhabitants. Soldiers created a hedgerow around the fort made out of natural growing honey locust. The honey locust is a tree that produces a large prickly thorn. The alliance between the Cherokee and British started off well. Trade was occurring on a daily basis between the Cherokee and British soldiers. Some of the soldiers felt so comfortable with their situation that they had their families brought to the fort and some of them even had children while they were there. This is believed to have been the first English children born west of the Appalachian Mountains. The British were supplying uh, goods that they had grown dependent on. In return, the Cherokees were trading deer skins. 250 years ago, deer skin was the currency. Captain Demeray wrote that so many Cherokees were bringing things into the fort that the fort took on the play or the look of a marketplace as Cherokees came and went. Uh, some of the soldiers lived out in the Cherokee villages with those people. So initially, the relationship between those troops and the Cherokees was uh, very, very good. The Cherokee village of Tuskegee grew up around Fort Loudoun because of the good relations between the Cherokee and British initially. However, the Cherokee-British alliance was undermined by suspicions and betrayals from both sides. In 1758, Cherokee warriors went north on behalf of the English and did battle with the Shawnee tribe. Uh, difficulties between the two started cropping up on that very expedition. Uh, in 1758. Uh, Cherokee warriors that uh, had gone off to Pennsylvania to fight on behalf of the uh, uh, English did not feel that they were being treated very fairly. They did not feel like that they were being uh, uh, compensated very well for their uh, service on behalf of the English king. Uh, consequently, uh, there are records that the uh, Cherokee warriors took liberties with livestock that belonged to settlers in Virginia and Pennsylvania 
and that uh, set in motion a series of events that eventually led to a dissolving of this alliance between the two. Relations soured even further when South Carolina frontiersmen invaded the lower Cherokee towns in present-day North Georgia just to obtain scalps. Several other violent incidents occurred, and the general in charge of the British forces in the Americas ordered his men to stop trading weapons, gunpowder, and ammunition with the Cherokee. The Cherokee, in turn, stopped supplying food to the soldiers, and on the order of the great war chief of the Overhill, Oconestota, the fort was surrounded and laid siege to. The inhabitants of the fort, those soldiers, those women, those children that lived here, found themselves, instead of living in the uh, land of friendly people, living smack dab in the middle of the Cherokee country, people that were then considered their enemies. So they were deep in enemy territory, uh, at the very end of a supply line that was very hard to maintain, and consequently found themselves in very, very deep trouble. Now, as far as the Cherokee response, that was often uh, came down to individuals. Uh, the Cherokees certainly did not have a centralized government like we are, are used to, although there were decisions that were made on behalf of a clan or a village or a town or a group or whatever. People often in the Cherokee Nation made their own decisions. Consequently, there were Cherokee headmen, for instance, Anna Kula Kula, uh, that supported the English all throughout this conflict. At that time, uh, Aconestota, the great warrior of the Cherokee Nation, declared all-out war on the British, in particular the colonies of South Carolina. Uh, forts in South Carolina, uh, North Carolina, Georgia were all attacked. Settlements were attacked. Uh, that was the incident that really pushed things over the edge. So here at Fort Loudoun, uh, as the winter of 1759 uh, moved into the spring of 1760 and then into the summer of 1760, uh, the threat of starvation, the threat of famine uh, is really what held or hung over the officers and the soldiers here. They just did not have the food necessary to sustain themselves. The men, women, and children inside the fort held out on the verge of starvation for much of 1760. Finally, in August, Fort Commander Captain Paul Demeray surrendered the fort to the Cherokee. The 230 inhabitants of the fort were promised safe passage across the Appalachian Mountains to Fort Prince George if they laid down their arms and surrendered the fort's 12 cannons. The British garrison had been escorted by a small group of Cherokee led by Conestota himself. On the night of August 9th, the garrison camped about 15 miles away from the fort on a small body of water known as Cane Creek. During the night, the Cherokee warriors abandoned the British and at first light attacked the garrison, killing about 30 men, including the fort's commander, Captain Paul Demeray. The survivors were taken hostage, where some died in the following months, some were exchanged back to the colonists, and others decided to live out their lives with the Cherokee. Although peace was once again reached with the Cherokee, Fort Loudoun was never rebuilt after being burnt to the ground. The charred remains sat neglected with only a stone marker being placed by the Colonial Dames of America in 1917, until the 1930s when the state and federal government appropriated monies to be used for the preservation and reconstruction of the original fort. Fort Loudoun was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1965. However, the story does not end here. In the 1970s, the Tennessee Valley Authority was going to dam the Little Tennessee River, creating a lake and submerging the historic site forever. The fort was dismantled and field dirt was used to raise the side of the fort 17 feet, placing it above the flood zone of the lake. The Fort Loudoun State Historic Park now rests 17 feet above the original fort and hosts events such as the 18th Century Trade Fair and Great Island Festival. The fort is also garrisoned one weekend a month by reenactors representing the men and women who lived in the fort and the Cherokee who lived around the fort. So ends our tragic tale of the men and women who lived and died in the Tennessee Overhill at a place called for Loudon.